Welcome to the new episode of All That Jazz. I'm your host, Matyash, and I have today with me Rolf Koch. I hope I said that right. He's from Germany, and he's a, he's a counselor and a, a student of Ayurveda, uh, Indian medicine that I find infinitely fascinating and I've always been curious about. So, um, And he's also uh, writing a book about Ayurveda. Uh, the first book is going to be in German, of course, but uh, I think... Uh, you are going to reach the English audience with this as well. So welcome to the show, uh, Rolf. Thank you, Matas, for having me. You're welcome. Um, so I, um, I think I um, met you on Facebook. Like I meet a lot of my guests and, uh, and you are very interesting because you were uh, in the IT business before you went into Ayurveda. Is that right? That is correct for most of my life and my entire career. Yeah, so um, you, you were um, even a, like a vice president of a company, is that correct? Yes, this was my last job assignment serving in a French company. And um, okay. having responsibility over all the sales activities in the world. Um, were, were you uh, ever interested in healing before? Uh, like, obviously, you went uh, for a job as uh, IT and all that, but uh, were you ever interested in healing before uh, before that? I have had great interest in healing since I'm basically a very young person. I remember my mother always telling me, uh, don't run around Jesus, like Jesus, um, trying to convert people trying to tell them how to live their life in a better mode. Um, you know, look, look after yourself first and then you can talk about this. And um, I didn't understand that. I still thought that I know a lot. I was always reading a lot about um, well-being and um, self-development. Even as a young child, I kind of um, uh, plundered the library of my mother and um, we had um, great books in Eastern Germany where I grew up, so I was uh, um, an avid reader. But obviously, as I've learned throughout the course of my life, you have to go through certain steps until you actually get to a point where you can help people in healing. But I have been interested in this for all of my life. Right. Um, okay, so uh, we're almost... Um, I, I'm here an inkling of destiny, so um, it's almost like you were destined to go into the IT business and learn about the world and then see maybe that it's not all that. It doesn't bring you happiness. Is that what happened? <laughs> <laughs> you hit the nail uh, on its head. Exactly. This is it. So I had to go through all of this, like most people do. Um, my career, I'm a father of an 18 year old son. I was married. We had a house. We had all of these things. Um, I left all this, I built it up again for another five, six, seven years until I realized I got so trapped in all this material world and this world of illusion and um, non-reality and um, permanent change that I was very desperate to find either the end of it, so a way out or um, some form of liberation. All right. So that to... led me to ending my job and ending all of this um, stuff that I did before. So it, was it was it like a big change uh, when you like gradually changed, or was it like I mean big change is like day from one day to the next, or was it like gradually like over a period of years where you realize this is not for you? Um, there's two answers. Um, I realized something had to change um, over a course of many years. Um, my health degraded. I was a uh, quite, quite an alcoholic. Um, I actually was a very aggressive person and the funny thing is, the more aggressive you become, the more, the less you like it, the more you want to do against it. Um, so that developed over the years. But the actual change that uh, happened in my life and that turned everything around happened just over 
something like six to eight hours very deep meditation on one day. It was the 28th of December, 2014. So uh, was it, um, uh, you, you were not uh, used to meditation. Did, did you like meditate before that or were you, okay. So was it like um, you decided just to meditate or did you go on a retreat? Um, so again, two answers. No, I did not meditate before, even though I had this meditation pillow as an alibi and I sometimes tried, but I couldn't sit the way I sit now, um, which took me years because I was very stiff. It was uh, very painful to actually try to sit in Sukhasana or any meditation seat. Um, so I didn't do it. I uh, found ways of calming down, but I had never really had a very deep meditation experience. So that day on the 28th, um, I got fed up with all this um, stuff that went on in the silent retreat that I was partaking. Um, and I decided after the morning satsang to leave this whole crowd and do my own thing because I, as I said, I was really fed up. It was not what I expected at this point. And I sat in a very uh, distant room, just on my own, a little pavilion. Um, in the cold, uh, wrapped in some sheets, and I decided that I would just sit here and calm down. I had nothing on my mind. I had no expectations, and I was definitely not going for liberation. I just, I wanted to get out of this mass of people that were, you know, doing all this satsang and guru thing. And uh, as far as I remember, I was sitting there maybe for 10 minutes and suddenly I was gone and I came back to myself um, after having some very profound experiences that um, I can vividly remember um, even today. Uh, I got back into this body or into this um, reality after about six to eight hours. I don't know exactly, but when I got up, people were sitting, um, just ending their um, supper. So I was going there in the morning and I came back and I joined these people when they were actually finishing their supper. So that was um, the indication of how long I must have been sitting there in meditation. I have a little trouble hearing you at times. Um, I think the volume is off a little bit. Okay. Um, so you were basically, um, you were there the whole, you were, you were meditating for a few hours and then it's kind of like you had a, you had a spiritual experience and you were like, almost like blissed out or passed out or what happened? What do you think happened? I cannot tell you what happened. <laughs> I can only tell you what I experienced. Yes. Um, as I said, I was sitting there and I remember seeing myself as a reflection in this, in this glass wall. Um, and I remember the thought, it looks really funny because I had those yellow um, blankets around me and I, I, I said to myself oh gosh you look like a little Buddha sitting there and that was amusing and that is the last thing I remember and then I went into this deep state of um, nothingness in which I um, well I'm, I'm not sure if I should describe it as an, okay, as an, that's fine. As I remember it, but it was a very blissful state. I um, experienced a lot of things, but the, the most profound experience that I had is that I realized I am that. I'm not this existence. I'm not this illusion. I'm that. And with that, I, I refer to what is called in Sanskrit, my heart. This is where I am. And since I am that, I'm everything. And I knew this. I, it was just, it was a revelation. I just, I didn't doubt it. I never questioned it um, after that. I just knew I'm everything. I'm connected to everything. Everything is connected to me. And um, it just um, underlined everything I've learned, even as a Buddhist many years before, that you cannot uh, act violently um, towards other people, nor to yourself, um, because you're all one. So if you don't want to hurt anyone, um, you shouldn't hurt yourself first and then don't go out there and hurt neither plants or animals or anything that is um, a sentient being. And um, this again brought me back to this whole theme in my life. You want to actually heal people, which is not doing Reiki or um, 
advising them to take some herbs. It's basically helping them to get into their heart and find what I found. That's total healing. Once you know this, once you realize this, whether you call it Brahman or whatever you call it, um, you actually heal. Hmm. So um, did you do Reiki at one point as well? or? Um, I got my first initiation in 2003 while I was still living in Cyprus. And when I came back to Germany in 2005, I think six, seven and nine, I did three other initiations, uh, becoming a master Reiki master. I'm also initiating people and um, well, I'm doing Reiki ever since. But so Reiki came, Another, came before sorry? the spiritual experience. Oh, yes, words. definitely. Yeah, yeah. This was always on my path. There is massage practitioner, there is nutritionist, there's all this stuff that you need to uh, learn to help people um, to get better and uh, be more focused and more conscientious about what they do in their lives. Um, but, um, but nothing came close, obviously, to the spiritual experiences you had, that you had. Did you... Um, was it any kind of religious, uh, did, was it affiliated with any organization or anything, the, uh, um, the retreat that you went on? Um, I wouldn't say that retreat was affiliated to any religion. It is, um, the man who was conducting it is uh, said to be a second or third degree disciple of my guru, Ramana Maharishi. Um, who in 2014 um, kind of uh, appeared in my life as a book and I saw him on a book cover, his face, something I've never seen before and he, he deeply touched me. You saw the face of Ramana Maharshi, yeah? Yes. yes. I saw his eyes and I, I read things that I didn't understand at the time but um, that have profoundly changed my life after I realized what he was talking about. And um, is um, yeah, I've heard of Ramana Maharshi through my teacher David Hawkins, and he always spoke um, very highly of Ramana Maharshi, um, and uh, with great reverence. And uh, I have to say also, when I look at the pictures of Ramana Maharshi and all that, you can see that, and all the um, the clips on YouTube that I've seen of documentaries of him, it looks highly. Um, almost like not of this world, you know, because he had uh, transcended the world and um, very uh, mystic, you know, a very fascinating uh, soul probably to be around. And uh, um, so do you do you practice his uh, meditation? Who who am I? I think that's the inquiry. Who am I? What am I? Is that the inquiry, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't call it a meditation. So basically Ramana being um, a representative of a, um, you can call it a Hindu traditional philosophy. It's called uh, Advaita Vedanta. Um, he um, would all, obviously always uh, recommend uh, two forms of yoga. One is uh, Jnana Yoga, which means the yoga of knowledge. Um, which incorporates all these uh, inquiry processes that you go through. And the other is bhakti. So you go and uh, devote yourself to Guru or to Brahma or to that act of um, doing yoga in order to connect or to have a union back with God, uh, which is in uh, great length all described in the Bhagavad Gita. So you're very much influenced by the Hindu tradition that uh, Ramana Maharshi was part of now. I wouldn't call it Hindu tradition. I would call it um, universal religion, if you, if you want so. Mm -hmm. It's nothing to do with Hinduism. It's nothing to do with Christianity, even though I used to be baptized. Um, as I was 16, I decided I want to find God through baptism. Didn't succeed. I became a Buddhist for over 20 years. I followed the Eightfold Path. I wanted to become a Buddhist monk when I was very young um, to get closer to God or whatever I thought would be there. It didn't work out. Um, and um, after my awakening, if you want so, I realized that you don't need any of this. All you need to do is go back to your find yourself. It's nothing to do with religion. 
Okay. So after you uh, had the awakening, what happened in your life? What changed? Everything changed. <laughs> <laughs> Everything changed. Uh, well, I actually, um, you, can, you can say I had a life. I wasn't a machine anymore. I wasn't um, the, the, the seed, the, 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 the one that follows all the life. Um, I realized that there's, there's one very simple um, Sanskrit word that describes this, which is uh, part of the uh, Advaita philosophy. The word is called Maya, of which we derive also the word magic um, etymologically. And um, it is basically the illusion, the, uh, the seed of what we see as reality. And uh, when you see through this, when you stop this superimposition of um, superimposing a assumed reality onto what is real, um, everything has changed. You, you cannot go back. It's like, uh, I use this example, it's like licking one's blood. Once you have licked blood, only once in your life, you always remember that taste. You can't escape from it. It's burned yeah. into your consciousness. And this is the same that happens once you wake up, once you realize that you are everything and everything is you, it's contained within you and you are contained with a, within everything and you can't escape from each other. It's just one creation. And as there is a super creator, there is this creator. And this gives you so much power to know that you can create everything. I can create this podcast. I, I created, because I wanted to do this, the connection to you. I was very interested in getting to know you. And um, so we connected. Here we are. So it all follows this connection. If you do things with your heart and if you put some consciousness to it, um, you can be anything, you can create anything. So this helped me um, to lead the life I'm leading now. I did uh, another education. I focused a lot on Ayurveda, which was uh, since 2004 part of my life. I studied this. I um, experimented with it. I had um, very positive feedback and responses uh, from people that I worked with. And since 2015, um, I basically began to devote my life towards um, Ayurveda and anything that is connected to Ayurveda. Is that when you had the spiritual experience in 2015? 14, I had the so-called Atma Vikara and um, after that it all changed. I stopped working as the vice president I sold most of my possessions uh, or got rid of many things that I thought make up this personality. I'm interested in what, what goes in the thought process when you're like, I can't be in this job anymore, even though it's, uh, it's it was probably nicely paid and all that, but you were like, I just, I just, you know, what's the decision process there? You're just like, I just can't do this anymore. Or what is it? <laughs> we, we should call in Janine, who um, I've met on the 9th of January 2015. She is basically my first relationship um, that I've ever experienced. Even though I was married, I would never say that I really was in a relationship. I was always escaping. I was not satisfied. I was um, many things, but I was not in a loving relationship. And um, so I met her. We are still together after so many years and thriving and um, developing. And um, she went through this process with me. So one of the things I recall is after I sold my cars, which defined me prior to 2015, and I was in the process of buying a fourth car actually, and I was owning my motorcycle. And so I, I had sold all of this and we lived in Freiburg at this time. And I was going through the streets and I kind of to to um, enforce this new lifestyle within me, I, I was looking at all these cars and I was getting on her nerves by saying, how can you have a car like this? Why would you buy something like this? I would never do this. I would never buy a car like this. <laughs> so in this process, I kind of established to me the fact that you don't need a car. You don't need to run after this. It's not a symbol of your, um, um, of your status. It's not idealistic or it's not an idol. It's just, it's a, it's a means of transportation. And that it was never to me. So that was one of the big processes I had to go through. Most of the things I could let go very easily. My art, 
in this room, nothing hangs here. I was actually renting apartment based on the wall uh, size because I have big pictures, big, big art. I needed to have apartments that obviously cost a lot of money, but that have a lot of wall space so you can hang your pictures, which are right behind these curtains or somewhere hidden in this apartment. Um, I could get rid of all of this. I didn't need that anymore. Mm -hmm. The only problem that I had was a physical. I was not able to drop my alcohol consumption from one day to the other. That took me a long time. But you did it without, because um, uh, I know a lot of people there in the 12 steps and all that, but you did it without, uh, um, you did it based on following the spiritual practice, basically. Um, yes, and also um, common sense. I'm advocate, uh, advocating um, Ayurvedic lifestyle, and um, that meant for me to clean up my mess. So I, got, I, I, I don't take any drugs or consume any substance. Um, I, so I, I had to stop drinking alcohol. And actually, after a while, I, I found it disgusting. I don't like wine anymore. I may take a spirit, especially when I go to your region, um, take a little <laughs> to, to the, or something. To the Balkan yeah. region, yeah. Yes, which I uh, very much love to go there and uh, we have lots of friends there. So, um, but apart from this, everything is gone. So my, my whole physical body is clean, as, as good as I could clean it. Because I think if you want to, um, be uh, a tool for healing, as, which I consider myself a tool, having this knowledge, having some abilities, um, then you have to be pure, you have to be clean. Uh, what do you think about, uh, no, what, what does Arvida think about the, the consumption of alcohol? I imagine it's only a tiny bit, maybe wine, that's what I imagine it to be. You find throughout the text, um, namely in the Charaka Samhita, for example, um, preparations for alcoholic beverages. Usually they are some form of wine, um, but obviously um, it is a always, it had always been known that it is a very dangerous toxin and um, it has never been um, um, proposed to be something used for um, pleasure or enjoyment. It is either for medical purposes or it is recommended only in very small dosages. But there is, the Charaka Samhita has many references to alcoholic beverage. Okay. In uh, the same way as it um, has um, references to meat consumption, because what we should speak about right at this point, because there are some ideas in people's heads that Ayurveda or Ayurvedic um, nutrition uh, is uh, vegan or I, uh, is vegetarian. It is not. It is well, not recommended to eat meat, but meat will be found, found even in the old Vedic scriptures. You find um, a lot of recommendations how to prepare meat, what meat to eat, and which season, etc. So what it's not a meatless so, cuisine. What about Ramana Maharshi? Did he eat meat? As far as I know, he did not. Okay. And I'm a vegetarian myself since I'm 22 years old. Yeah, I myself am not a vegetarian, but I, but I don't eat much meat. And I remember uh, times when I would be eating downstairs, actually in this house, because this is where I mostly grew up. Uh, and uh, uh, my, uh, my grandfather would tease me and he'd be like, are you a vegetarian? You know, you don't like, you don't, are you not eating meat? <laughs> so it's, um, I think eating meat is part of the um, I think it's a, like a worldwide culture except maybe in India and, and other places where there's less consumption of meat but like most of Europe I think Africa for sure I was with um, I was living in uh, France and there was a Catholic priest from Kenya and uh, I distinctly remember for Christmas we didn't have meat the whole day we didn't eat meat and he was saying say the maj meaning like it's such a pity that we don't <laughs> We're not eating meat today because he was so used to eating meat. Uh, yeah, Wabehu, shout out. Anyway, um, I, um, yeah, so it's hard for people to 
to to break the habit of meat let's say what would your if people do eat meat what would you think um is the best kind of meats to eat no meat no meat <laughs> Well, there's two things about eating meat that uh, people should uh, think about it. And I'm also writing about this in my book, not at great length, but um, at least to an extent that you can actually uh, make sense out of it. So the first thing you, you should uh, think about is um, we have a cat, which we brought from Croatia as a tiny little kitten. We um, brought it up with a little syringe and later with some uh, milk in a bottle and uh, bottle fed it. It's very attached to us and it is an animal and actually it is a carnivore it's um, a, a predator and uh, if you look at our cat that um, regularly brings in mice that she catches at night um, she is built to be a predator she is built for meat consumption yes um, so the first thing you should think about is uh, that your organs as a human being are not set up the way as it is for a carnivore. Um, I don't want to go into this unless you, re uh, you ask me to, but um, there is many, many details that you can look at, which will indicate that we are not made for meat consumption. Okay, we, we can eat meat and yes, it will make us sick over time, but we um, are not built for that. We are not a predator. We don't have all the features predators have um, looking at my cat or a dog or any other predator. The second thing that you need to consider when you eat meat is, would you eat another sentient being if you knew it, if you had met it, if you know the cow of which this sausage has been made? Would you eat that? If it even had a name, if you had it brought up from a small calf, um, when it turned into a cow, would you have killed it to eat it? Um, um, yeah. The uh, anonymity of what we find in supermarkets and discounters um, is the only way for us to actually eat um, that animal. If we had to grow it and kill it in order to consume it, we, I guess at least half to maybe two, three quarters of all meat eating people would stop eating meat. So um, yeah. this follows a principle which is called Ahimsa. It's the principle of nonviolence, which I first came in contact with um, when I became a Buddhist. And I, um, well, it got stuck with me. I do sometimes kill a fly or a mosquito. I'm not a saint. If it, if it really gets onto me, then I might just squash it. Dead. I feel very bad Dead. about this, I admit. <laughs> um, yes, I do, actually. Um, and I always think, how can this little, this little animal get on my nerves? What's wrong with me? Yeah, I, I see the, the failure in me. But then again, I'm just another normal man that kills some flies. But I could never, ever think of actually um, being violent towards a larger sized animal or even a human being or anything else. Even when I break off something of a plant, I feel that this plant will feel that. That plant, it doesn't yeah. go by this plant without- I, I was gonna order. say that, yes. Uh, what about plants? They're alive, they're, they, they must be on some level aware that they're alive. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, there was a famous experiment done by a uh, ex-CIA guy that hooked up uh, Mm, I think a, almost like a lie detector or some kind of detector on yes, a plant I, I, I know the and, and the plant knew which guy it was because there was several guys and one of the guys uh, uprooted a plant and the uh, the plant, the other plant, that was, there was two plants and the other, the other plant was able to identify which guy did it. Uh, yes. I thought it was amazing. Um, yeah. Uh, very, very interesting experiments prior to that one that you referred to, done by Russian um, scientists in the, uh, I think it started in the 50s, but uh, very, very many in the 70s. And um, not only do plants communicate through the soil, through their food system, but they also communicate through pheromones uh, through the air. So if you harm one plant at, at that point or at that place in your room, it will then be able to tell another plant in the other on the other side or in the other corner of the room that there is danger approaching. Wow. Some uh, cases that you find in um, 
certain trees in Africa, when the giraffes approach, the trees fold on all their leaves so that only the thorns stick out. Wow. So the giraffes are eating on one plant and all the other trees in the surrounding are actually um, hiding their leaves. And that is mm-hmm. done through pheromones. So plants communicate, which means it's like a fly. If it can sense danger by me approaching with my hand and it goes off, then it must have consciousness. And the same is true for plants. They have consciousness. And there's the big dilemma. If I don't eat animals, but I eat plants, am I now allocating or requiring bad karma? Or what is what is wrong? <laughs> uh, I, I've d- pondered over that for many years. I do have an answer if anybody is interested. But Go ahead. Um, it is a very ambiguous question. Yes. Um... I would say myself for uh, for the plants that they uh, perhaps uh, I don't know if you're aware of Rupert Sheldrake, but he says that plants they have a morphogenetic field and the same like school of fish because they move as one and it's not I don't think it's possible that every fish just looks at where the other fish is. I think they're connected to a field, and uh, Sheldrake also did uh, research on. Uh, dogs that know when you're coming home and uh, but that seems to indicate that there's not just because it's not possible for the dog to know uh, that the owner five kilometers from the home or five miles from the home will will know at the random time when he'll come home because the dogs 80 percent of the time within two minutes the dog goes into a waiting position despite physically not even being possible that the uh, the dog even knows that the owner is coming home because there's so many cars that were like, how can you, and it's in the house usually because they were recording yeah. it in the house. Anyway, I want to get, I want to get to the Ayurveda. Like, okay, let's, let's say I have a headache. Let's say I have a yeah. headache. Okay. Uh, Western medicine says, no, I don't have right now, but I had the, when I was fasting on Friday, I had a headache. So <laughs> I was like, Ugh. I, w- I was a bit annoyed. Anyway, and the Western medicine says um, uh, you take aspirin or you take or you take something. Um, uh, what does Ayurveda say about that? <laughs> okay. well, it's a complicated guess, question. I, it's like, actually, it's an easy question to answer. But the point here is that uh, for those who don't know how Ayurveda or how one who deals with Ayurveda looks at the world, um, it may be confusing, but let, let me answer the question. Okay. Um, so first of all, there's different types of headaches. There is a headache attached to each dosha. So there is a vata headache, there is a pitta headache, and there's a kapha headache. Okay, so there's one in the front and there's one in the back and there's one in general maybe. Is that, is that it? Uh, not really, but uh, no, you can't even generalize like this. Um, but you can distinguish them even by the place, how they appear in your head, but also by the type of pain. But then the first thing you should do is you need to identify what type of constitution are you. Okay, because we all have a, a base constitution called Prakriti in uh, um, Sanskrit, which is our, uh, our, our blueprint. And um, only if we are in equilibrium, in balance, if we are in a state of health, we will be in a balanced state with our doshas, which mm-hmm. form that faculty. So um, if you have a headache, you're obviously not in balance. So if I know your practically, if I know um, what is your main dosha, for example, I can uh, derive to what is called bikrti, which is the deviation of your normal state of health of your balance. And then we need to look at many factors. We need to look at what are the possible stressors? What is wrong with your nutrition? So basically we have to do a diagnosis. We have to look at uh, where does it come from and what is it now that you need to go back into balance, to go back to a healthy state. If you just look at the symptom and you take some uh, salicylic um, acid, like an aspirin, all you do is you, you uh, um, block the pain receptors. Right. So there is no more pain. But the source of what you call a headache is still there. And uh, so Ayurveda doesn't look at the headache as a symptom. It looks at 
what causes this symptom because usually or most of the times it comes with additional symptoms it's just the head that you notice there's probably something wrong in your stomach or in your intestine somewhere in your larger intestine or in your smaller intestine there may be something wrong uh, in your structure because if you have tensions in your bag they can rise into your head and they give you this tension headache um, if there's something wrong with your nervous system, which is one of the seven tattoos of Ayurveda um, or in the Ayurvedic system, um, then you could uh, even get a migraine. Right. So there's a lot so of co potential many, causes. many, many ways of looking at it. Excuse wow. me, I interrupted. Sorry, what did you say? Sorry. Uh, so there's many potential uh, causes. It's not just, uh, you know... Um, it's very complicated. You have to you have to narrow it down to uh, what exactly is it, and uh, and then fix the source of the problem. Yes, yes. So for or me, let's say, like go. I gave to Celine, um, I, I believe two or three days ago, she said, "Ralph, do you want to give me Reiki, or shall I take an Ibu um, some some pill?" Um, I said, well, obviously I give you Reiki. And then Reiki has a different approach. Reiki is as an energy treatment. It goes to where on an energetic level you have a blockage and resolves this blockage. So that could be either structural, it could be your muscular system, or it could be something else in your body. And Reiki usually resolves this. So like 10, 15 minutes after that, the headache is gone. But I still call this a symptomatic approach because you're resolving the symptom you're not actually helping that person to heal so ayurveda helps uh, heal on a deeper level because you find the source so from because it was not just me it was my friend uh, the, there was three of us um, doing the fast and two of us had the, uh, the headache you know so it's very interesting in, in this case it would be probably um very simple to explain because you're running out of glycos in your brain you're getting a headache because your brain now signals i need food that's what usually happens to a fast but what happened the second day i woke up and i was i was feeling great i was feeling better than the first day i was like feeling i could i, I could probably go on to do maybe three days but the first Usually when I did the fast, the first day was the hardest. Um, you're then switching into, most of the times at least, you switch into a ketone metabolism. So yes. your liver produces ketone bodies and they provide the energy also to the brain. And uh, so the headache is gone. The headache usually during fasting indicates a malnutrition, some de depreciation of, of um, urgently needed energy. And uh, as soon as the liver changes into the ketone metabolism, then again, you have energy available in form of ketone bodies or fat, um, and then the headache is gone. Right, right, right. And so you feel energized, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, tell me about the book, because you're writing the book, and obviously it is um, it is your work, and you're writing it in German, but... Um, uh, what other elements of Ayurveda is that people uh, don't no normally know from the West? Because me um, looking, um, I've never tried, I, I would love to try, you know, go, go to Ayurvedic pr practitioner and, and, and try it for myself. Because I like to try, you know, things uh, hands-on and to see, to see um, how it works and all that. I've tried different healing modalities and all that. And and uh, I think uh, when people try for themselves, they can really know how it really works when they see the difference in their lives, you know. I think that this was pretty much anything. So what do you think in Ayurveda that most people in the West do not realize? I have an idea. This is why I write the book. And what I think most people do not realize, and this is kind of backed up through my practice to me working with people. Um, and it is actually something we all should know because even my grandmother who has had no idea about Ayurveda used to say that death starts in your colon. So anything related to digestion is one of the most essential things in Ayurveda. Even if you take medication, um, you can call them dravya, any substance that you enter through your mouth 
or even through the next door um, that comes in contact with your digestive system or even the lungs if you want to. Um, this substance needs to be digested or otherwise it will have to pass through it and will leave you again at the rear end. If we digest whatever we put in here, and we call this usually nutrition, if we digest that properly and we provide everything that our body needs, and that is surprisingly very little, um, especially as a grown up, when we do not have to grow and build a body anymore, um, if you provide everything we need and we digest it properly, and there's the trick, we need to learn how to digest properly, then we will be until the end of our lives and there will be a, an end, obviously, um, at a given time. And it can be very painful. Let's cut out all the accidents and um, things that happen throughout the sources. But if death has to occur, which it will at some point um, as a natural phenomena of this body, then it should be a very pleasant path towards that and also a pleasant experience. We are not forced to die in pain, suffering. This body at some point will just simply shut down. That's the way it is built. And then we have autolysis and all these processes that start helping resolve this, this physical body. In order to get there, there is, according to Ayurveda, three things we need to consider. Ahara, which is nutrition, Nida, which is sleep, and Brahmacharya, which is, uh, I translate it as a conscious or, um, yeah, let's, let's call it a conscious lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You can uh, uh, translate the word Brahmacharya in many ways. It is in a different uh, meaning. It is also a stage of life. It's the first stage in the life of a disciple or of, of a person, the first 20, um, sorry, um, the first, uh, yeah, 25 years. So it's like a spiritual um, practice, almost like a, how you are living your days yes. and mentally. Now, yeah. now, how you live your days in Ayurveda is called Dinacharya. Okay. We have the word again, which is the routine. It's the daily routine, Dina for day and Charya for routine. But Brahmacharya is also um, um, in, in another system or in another way of uh, looking at the word, it is the first 25 years, how you're being brought up and how you're actually studying about life and Brahma in this case, uh, the universe and how it is all connected. And then you go into a different phase, which is called Grastani, where you are the householder and you're actually having children build your house, etc. And then you have two more stages. The latest uh, will be uh, Sanyasi, um, where you actually devote the last 25 years of your life towards um, God, exploring God, getting close to God. And, um, but in this case, in the uh, Traya Stampa, which it is called the three uh, pillars of Ayurveda, it is the healthy, um, conscious lifestyle, which mm -hmm. also uh, includes Ahimsa, the principle of nonviolence towards other beings, because being violent to other people or being a very aggressive person also makes you sick, especially right. here. <clears throat> so, if you have only three pillars, there's very little we need to focus on. Ahara, our food, our sleep, and our lifestyle. Okay, so let's break it down then. Food, you're, you're advocating for the um, mostly plant-based diet. Would that be correct? Okay. Lacto-vegetarian lifestyle because we need to include milk products. We are not vegans because I also am a beekeeper. I have my own honey. Honey is a very... Um, holy uh, nutrient in, in Ayurveda, but also anything made from cow milk. Right, of course, uh, I, I I do know uh, Hindus love their their cows and the cow milk. Right, <laughs> I didn't realize the that. Pharmacy of the human being. It, occur, it occurred to me just as you said it. Um, okay, sleep. Uh, something I uh, have to say, I kind of I usually neglect, as I've told you before. And I go to sleep usually very late. And um, I have to admit that I've recorded a, some of the podcasts here very late at night, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, there's also a time difference, I have to say, between here and the US. But anyway, um, so uh, 
I guess it would depend how much sleep you get on the type of body, right? And when you get to sleep, right? Um, if I understand your question right, then you're asking is the, the time you need to sleep and uh, also when you go to bed dependent on your constitution? Yes. And yes, it is. <clears throat> As we said, we have three main types. We have seven in total because we have mixed forms and we have one form that is an equal. Um, right. So, so let's say for me, let's say for me, because um, uh, we don't have any other person that other than you and me on this podcast. <laughs> so. so you have a, you have a, um, as I told you before, um, looking at you, you have a very uh, strong pitta dosha that is um, governing your constitution. I do not see the vata, as I said before, I see more of the kapha element. So I would say if, um, we can confirm this one day, um, your Pitta Kapha constitution or Prakriti, um, which means um, you have a very favorable Prakriti, a very, very favorable constitution. I always compare this uh, for people that uh, I talk to, uh, to a uh, Vulcan on a very fertile soil or ground. So one spits the fire and by that fire and that lava that goes out there, you, you, you nurture the uh, surrounding and that is wait I'm, I'm the volcano i'm the volcano that empty earth okay and the soil around right. that is very fertile uh, usually you find this in um uh, very sportive people that have a lot of uh, dynamics power and also the endurance of the kapha element the stability and um i would say that i, I assume your pitta is um, more in your practice than the kapha element. You have probably a lot less uh, vata. And that means that you're, the time that you sh uh, should go to bed is actually quite early. Because we have, before pitta time starts at uh, uh, 22 hours, at 10 o'clock at night, we have the kapha time, which is the time of the day when uh, darkness sets in, mm -hmm. everything becomes heavy, and dull and um, uh, there's a word guru, dark. And, and then at 22 hours, the pitta time starts. And uh, this is uh, usually where you can enter into your very um, vivid dream phases where you can be very active if you're already sleeping. Same is true if you're not sleeping, you again become very active and this phase goes for three hours. Yes. So until I... about one o'clock, you will be um, in your pitta phase. If you go to bed when uh, night falls, which will support your kapha, because if you stay up at that time, your kapha will rise again. That is actually favorable for you to fall asleep because it will make you tired, like in most people. What is kapha again, and, sorry? Hmm? What is kapha? Oh, kapha is the earth and water element. Okay, it is the okay. the of the three dosha. And um, so it is moist, it is heavy, it mm. is dark, it is um, solid. And um, this is what happens at night. We, we become heavy, we become, it becomes dark outside. We really want to go back inside. We, we uh, pull ourselves together towards the inside. And if we are active, because like you, you are pitta, you're, you're, you're steaming, you're, you have a lot of dynamics, you have a lot of activity and you don't calm this down, you overcome this period until 10 o'clock, and then you're really awake, you're really yes. in that, your element. That is true, because I've experienced it sometimes at 10 o'clock, uh, sometimes 11, I'll be kind of uh, tired, but then at midnight, one o'clock, I'm like alert, I'm like yeah. ready to go, man. <laughs> yeah, I know that. I'm a pitta, I'm a pure pitta, which is um, not very favorable, it's quite dangerous. Um, so I'm, I'm a lot of fire. If I go to bed before 10 or at around 10-ish, I have the most profound and, and healing and healthy sleep. Mm. If I go beyond that and I can easily go until one or two, I will be messed up next day. And it has also to do with our circadian um, hormone rhythms. We build hormones when it is getting dark, which right. is namely melatonin, um, and then if this is built up and we're falling asleep properly at about three o'clock when the next phase uh, is underway, 
um, we build up cortisol, which goes right until six, which we need because at six o'clock we are in the kapha phase. We're entering the kapha phase, which is then the the the, the day uh, rises. We're coming out of the darkness, so we need some hormone that actually uh, brings us into motion, and that is cortisol. We fail at night to go to bed, and we interrupt this cycle. We are not building the cortisol, and this is what we usually experience also, especially in severe conditions like depression. We don't get out of bed in the morning. We have this grinding thought process going on. We are all negative, pessimistic. We, we are lazy. We are dull. I've this experienced that, yes. I've experienced uh, just being in bed and uh, on my tablet for sometimes a while, but it depends on the day, though. Um, yeah. But I never connected it to sleep. Hmm. Oh, yes. No, you actually, you can connect it to how you go to sleep. Right. At what time you go to sleep. And then what will your sleep look like until you get up? So right. um, again, looking at various types, and uh, there is a lot to say uh, about sleeping. Um, I have, it's a smaller chapter, but I have an entire chapter just on sleeping. Um, because there is um, also things that you, if you can't sleep, if, if you find it very difficult to go to bed at, at say 10, then there are certain things you can do. One of the easiest things you can do is make yourself a golden milk. And uh, the spices and the way of the preparation of that particular milk is actually going to help you to fall asleep. To actually, again, rise the kapha, rise that heaviness in your body, make it dark make it dull and then you just sleep well, away is there any um uh three body types or any combination thereof of the seven that uh likes to go to sleep late like past midnight yeah pita pita so i'm i so you said i'm a combination of uh which pita one kapha. Oh, kapha. that's that's why okay so so i'm a combination of both two Okay. Yeah, since we didn't start by explaining this, um, each of these uh, three doshas or the mixed forms inherit the um, properties, or in, in Sanskrit it's called guna, of um, that particular element or the two elements that actually form um, this particular dosha. So if we look at we have mentioned it before, kapha, mm -hmm. which is the heaviest. It is built of the uh, um, two elements, earth and water. In Sanskrit, are called bhuta or mahabhuta. Right. So um, we have uh, a very heavy element, the heaviest actually, which is formed a lot of um, by by um, uh, carbon and many many other minerals. And we have water, which makes it sticky moist heavy like think, think of, a, of a of a block of um um what do you use for pottery um soil right and on the other on the other end of the scale you have the air and ether element akasha and vayu and both of those are very light one is space and one is the air that fills the space so all the properties that come with space itself and the air within, which is obviously movement, it is cooling, it is very light, it is very uh, mobile, etc. All these elements are now, if you are vata, dosha, prakriti, they are part of your physical constitution. Okay? Mm -hmm. So if you are pitta vata, you have the heaviness of this um, of this kapha element. You have the endurance, also the the capability of building, of rebuilding, of using. Of actually, it's also sluggish. It's slow, and you have the dynamics, the power, the the um, fantasy, the ideas, the uh, productive force um, of um, the pitta element. If you combine both, you can, and I guess this is true for you, you can use your stability and your ongoing power 
combined with this energy, this pitta element, and you can stay up for very long at night. Yeah, that's what I do sometimes, often actually. <laughs> When we talk about sleeping, the same you cannot say about your sleep actually. I, I, I wonder if this is true, but I, I assume it will be. If you sleep, let's say earlier, you must be a person that gets up early as well. If you have a healthy sleep, you should be getting up quite early. Yeah, I, um, I don't know. I've never been, um, I've mostly been a late sleeper. So the times I went to sleep early, yeah, I mean, I woke up earlier, but that to me is logical because if I went to sleep earlier, I would wake up earlier. Like it's, uh, oh. no? Well, yes, in some way, yes, but it's not logical. You can also go at 10 and you can sleep until, let's say, nine. If you're Vata conditioned, you can have a long sleep. Right, but since the pitta is uh, destined to get into action again in the next day, um, you you should be fine with between something six, seven, probably seven ish, maybe eight hours of sleep. Vatas tend to sleep longer. Kaphas need less sleep actually. You can, as a kapha constitution, you can sleep, let's say five to six hours, and you're done. Right. But I remember one time, But though, you, you will not get up if you don't get to bed early. If you sleep into the kappa right. phase again, then you will stay in bed. So if I went to sleep at, let's say, at 10, then I can wake up at four. But only if I go to sleep before 10. Right. You probably could. I do that as a pitta. If I go to bed early, usually I get up between four and five. And if I'm if I do not want to go back to uh, back to bed, I stay up and I can stay up the same amount of hours as if I was getting right, up. Right, right, right. I use that time usually to do my meditation and my Agni Hotra, the morning fire, and do all these beautiful things when I get up early. I, you know, I remember one time it was quite embarrassing for me because I had, uh, there was one year in trade school when I was about 15 or 16 that I had school in the afternoon. And one time I overslept because I went to sleep probably one in the morning and I slept until 2 p.m. So I slept for some reason I slept 13 hours and then I had to I told the truth I said I overslept but it was <laughs> you know, I, I came like a uh, half past two or something but uh, it was funny and uh, you would say that is because I went to sleep late so that's why I needed longer sleep basically without the alarm clock right Not only that, there may be some activity right, right. that you did before okay. that's very exhausting. And, um, uh, but well, I can give you only the guidelines what, what you sh what, not even what you should do. I, 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 just, I tell people what I have learned, what I have experienced, and what the scriptures say, and what common sense tells us, and even modern science. Right. And um, you choose. How do, how do you, you said the colon is very uh, important. How do you keep the colon uh, healthy? <laughs> very simple. <laughs> Just eat the right things that are right for you, for your body type, for your constitution. Then it will take care of itself because you have a microbiome. You inherited it most likely from your mother. So that is a microbiome that goes back centuries because it's always been with the mother of the mother of the mother of the mother until your mother. And then you got it when you get, usually when people come out through natural birth, um, it's very different um, when, you, when you are a cesarean born baby, but you get this microbiome, it enters your system and it will stay there and it will either thrive or it will suffer. Why, why is it so different on Caesar uh, born children? Because they're still, You still grow up like nine months in the mother. Yes, but uh, <laughs> in there is totally clean. It's um, how how's it called? Um, st st sterile. It's a sterile environment. Right. So the moment the baby goes through the birth channel, head first, the entire vaginal and anal microbiome that is there at this point in time enters through nose and mouth into the body. It comes into your lungs. And it comes into the, first of all, it stays in the stomach. Uh, There's certain bacteria that get in there and that prepare the grounds. And then slowly, slowly with food and the first thing with your mother's milk, 
there will come bifidobacteria and all these kind of bacteria that actually start forming your microbiome. Wow. I, I don't know if I wanted to know that much information. That kind of engrossed me out just a little bit. <laughs> yes, but that's how you get to the yes. bacteria that actually enter your body. Um, but when you're Caesar born, you don't get that experience because no. you're okay. You're taken that's... out from a sterile environment just like that. So actually, I've read years ago in the US, there are now practices where they take um, some um, part of the bacteria from the mother and put it into the baby's mouth to help the process because we have a lot of people uh, that live with really nasty allergies etc that are cesarean born babies and oh. they didn't build up a proper immune system and if on top you're not breastfed you really you're you're in for quite a bad deal right wow i never connected that to health problems but you're oh, saying oh, yeah. you have to you're saying cesarean born babies and babies that aren't fed breast milk are actually more disposed to allergies and all kinds of health problems yes not only studies i know people and you may know people that um, suffer this destiny uh, it is just like that because it's the non-natural way of birth the natural way is go through the channel get all the microbiome and then being fed by your mother on her breast get that that right. tissue that comes out of here that's a living tissue mother's milk is not a white liquid it is a tissue that has a lot of cells in it a lot of information and a lot of uh, stuff that the baby needs to grow into a healthy infant right so right. The bacteria that are here at the nipple at the area where the where the baby suckles are very intense and they need to get into this little baby's mouth and build up its immune system hmm. um, because that is our immune system 95 percent of our immune system are at the colon area because that's where we are in contact with the outside world it's the skin which is usually quite well protected it's our lungs, which is usually quite protected through a mucus lining, which is uh, lining the entire inside of our lungs. And it's our, our uh, um, in a gastrointestinal tract. And that's about seven meters of area where we can get into contact with the outside world. Otherwise, there's no way of us to actually absorbing outside substances unless we inject it. Right, right. Um, so, um, would you recommend that people look up online, which type they are to see what kind of foods, because obviously you said the the food that you have to eat is, uh, is dependent on the type of body that you are and the microbiome of your mother. Now to know both of those two, you probably need a Ayurvedic practitioner and how they know what, the uh, microbiome of the mother is little do they have to study like what the like constitute like you saw my constitution and to see the constitution of the mother or how does that work how does the practitioner know the microbiome that is settling in your colon has nothing to do with well actually it has but that is probably um, extending the frame of our conversation. Right. We have actually three enterotypes that we can identify, which are related to our practice. So yes, you can actually um, look at this. And if you really want to take this into consideration, you need to go to a practitioner that actually can take a sample of your stool and analyze it. And then it will see by the um, inhabitants of your colon what type you most likely are, but um, you can also see it, um, especially if you if you have a medical uh, uh, history, you can see it on your diseases, you can see it on the problems that you carry with you, what type of microbiome or enterotype you are. Yes, because we're right. talking about thousands of organisms. And we don't know the exact ratio of how they live together. We can never say we even if you do an, an uh, coloscopy or anything like this, we cannot see this uh, because they are just too minute. We cannot analyze stool and have a very solid um, um, understanding of what is going on because mostly we get only what is in our larger uh, intestine. We don't see what is in the arrow in the um, former, in the earlier part uh, of our intestine. 
but we can look at the mother at her constitution. We can uh, take certain assumptions, but we can definitely look at your constitution and um, know pretty sure what it is that you should eat. And this is very simple. Why can we be so sure? Because we are talking about thousands of years of empirical knowledge. We are not mm -hmm. talking about a science that is 200 years old. We are talking about thousands, millennia of empirical knowledge. So we know if you are a pitta constitution, then this is not the food you should eat, but rather eat that food. So don't eat beetroots or don't eat carrots, rather eat juicy, uh, moist, simple vegetables such as zucchini, for example. You shouldn't eat a lot of um, cabbage uh, vegetables. You could eat broccoli, but most of the pittas know that broccoli will lead to um, noise. Yeah, digestion so, issues, yeah. So then there is, uh, if you know that, then there is a lot of things that you know that you can actually eat. Now, what we also know empirically, because our microbiome is also known for thousands of years, there's not only words that describe it, but there is also an understanding how it works. And that is given in the scriptures, which are at least 3000 years old, and this knowledge already existed thousands of years before that. So we know that if we eat certain vegetables, if we follow certain eating rules or um, habits, we will strengthen our microbiome or we will weaken it and we will get sick. Compare this and uh, combine this with your dosha, which is the physical constitution. It's nothing to do with the inhabitants of your intestine. You know exactly what a person should do if he is um, if he shows certain symptoms, right? And that um, is always based on your constitution. That's the first thing you need to know, and that's what. Apart from certain other things, there is a whole diagnosis process in Ayurveda. But the first thing that you need to know is what type of practice does this person have? How is it deviated today? What is status quo? So what do you need to do to go back there? If you do that, you don't need to measure calories. You don't need to know how many grams of fat is in that uh, food. You just need to um, implement the properties that you need to come from status quo to your, uh, to your um, healthy state in which you are balanced. Right. So it's so all about properties of your food, of the environment, etc. So would you say it's not enough to, because uh, a lot of people nowadays are going vegan or vegetarian. Um, and while that is maybe an improvement over um, whatever they were eating before, it is, um, you know, some people are not eating like they might be vegetarian, but they might be eating a lot of, you know, still um, stuff, processed foods, you know, that are vegetarian or whatever. And you, would you advise I to do all this stuff, yes. soya products, not good. No, no, no soya products. And uh, I read the In soya moderation. are estrogenic anyway, so it's not good for, for guys to, uh, <laughs> no, no good. <laughs> um, you mentioned the age of Ayurveda and obviously it's older than the, the Chinese traditional medicine. What is your, um, I probably have at some point a uh, person from the Chinese traditional medicine, but what is your opinion of uh, Chinese traditional medicine from, uh, from your perspective? Um, my opinion is, um, I have a very high opinion. Um, it is their culture. It's China. It's billions of people that live there. And that, unfortunately, I guess a little more than it is uh, true for India, but they follow still their system even though they also have allopathic medicine and all this modern crap, pardon me, but this modern stuff that we see in many parts of this world. Um, but first of all, I believe that TCM um, derives from Ayurveda, like the very ancient Egyptian medicine, uh, all the Greek medicine that is highly influenced, the Arabic medicine, etc. Most of the medical systems that we know today seem to have their basis, their foundation in Ayurvedic medicine. Um, there is a, 
a lot of research, is, um, very nice uh, stories and studies about how this all reached into certain parts of the world. We know about the Greeks that studied in um, ancient uh, Indian universities, medical universities. We know this about uh, Chinese people, monks that traveled, that brought in the medicine. We know that this medicine or this medical system um, traveled along the Silk Road into uh, uh, your part actually is Slavic countries and uh -huh. also into um, the areas we live in today, um, Northern and Middle Europe, uh, which is also obviously uh, has get, get gotten a lot of stuff from the Romans and Greeks. But anyways, what do I um, uh, think of the TCM? I uh, appreciate it. I value it. I uh, know certain things. I know that it is as Ayurveda based on a five element uh, principle that they have these three doshas, they have chi, they have yin and yang, all these three are uh, compared to, um, to our doshic system in Ayurveda. And um, apart from having read two books that compare Ayurveda and um, uh, TCM directly, one is about the um, um, meridian system the acupressure that we have in Ayurveda, comparing it to the medical system of the TCM. It's actually written by my guru Basan Vlad and some other doctor. And uh, also the tongue reading, which is very famous in the um, TCM, but it is also um, uh, known in Ayurveda and uh, also practiced there. We have the pulse reading, which I also know from the Tibetan medicine. And I believe since they only go five levels deep, the Ayurvedic system, which uses seven levels of um, detecting through pulse certain um, certain um, indices or certain uh, um, how do you say this in English um, indications right. that your body through the pulse through your um, bloodstream. Uh, that is, as far as I know, by comparing the systems, a lot more elaborate. There is a huge um, pharmacological system in the TCM. I have only three books on that. I have several books on the Indian system, obviously, but that is a lot more elaborate on, in, on, on the TCM and, side. Right. But I believe it has to do with the fact that um, Ayurvedic medicine or practicing Ayurvedic medicine has been uh, prohibited in, in India by the English um, um, authorities, uh, the, the British Empire. Or authorities, yeah. yes. And only in the last uh, few decades, uh, it has been rediscovered in India and a certain Vaidya families obviously survived this repression or suppression or what it is called. Um, but um, yep. what, what didn't happen is that a huge body of modern scientific work or studies um, that exists in the TCM hasn't been done in the Ayurvedic system. It only started a few decades ago. And so Ayurveda lacks the so-called scientific proof that we find in the TCM. Right, is, is there a school um, that combines uh... The Western medicine with the Ayurvedic medicine, the way you can learn yeah. both, like a dual degree of, you know, a doctor that goes, could be uh, get a education in both um, the normal medicine and a bit of uh, Ayurvedic medicine and maybe even Chinese medicine, since they're. Uh, I'm not aware of an institution that does both. I know schools in India that teach Ayurvedic medicine. And uh, in the West, it's usually um, the way that you are a um, modern medicine doctor. Right. You have an MD, and then you specialize in Ayurvedic medicine by adding this, uh, this uh, by, by studying and adding this to your practice. In Germany, um, you can actually do this, but as far as I know, and I maybe, uh, I have to correct that, but uh, you're not allowed to practice Ayurvedic medicine in Germany, even though you may have a doctor's degree and an appropriation uh, as a doctor. Yeah, because the, the license, they don't give, uh, they don't give uh, the grants or whatever. They don't give uh, the permission to, for you to practice no. that. No. Right. Um, it's not a recognized medical system in Germany. 
what do you think uh, is the chakra system a uh, featured in because uh, i know the hinduism and buddhism also has the chakra system is that uh, um in any way uh in the um in the medicine itself in the ayurveda yes of course because we're not talking about just the physical body ayurveda is far more than first of all it has uh, eight schools or eight uh, um, areas that it deals with. There's also a pediatry and there's uh, the psychological aspects. Uh, wow, this is quite elaborate. So when- It's a whole medical science and system, of course. When can we expect your book? Maybe I'm putting you on the spot here, but- uh... <laughs> No, you don't. Uh, I was uh, uh, saying publicly that it, it will be ready in summer. It is not, it is, um, a lot more than I thought uh, it would be to write. Actually, writing a book is, I guess, not so problematic because if you know what you're writing about, you just write it. But then what becomes very tedious is to actually go through and make sure that the style is correct and uh, that you reference uh, the right stuff and whatever. So I'm, I have my book, but I need to actually work on it. I need to edit it and that takes weeks uh, actually, it takes months now, and um, so I guess the um, the day it will see the light um, is going to be aut late autumn, winter. Okay. Okay. Well, um, but coming, I want to come back to to your question about the chakras because um, when we practice Ayurveda, when we look at Ayurveda, we need to look at five sheets of this body, and there is an energetic body that is surrounding this physical body, and that. Uh, corresponds with the physical body and the outside world through the seven chakras, the, the seven main chakras and also minor chakras uh, on our body. And um, it, it, this this uh, energy sheet or this energy body um, is uh, called uh, pranayama, mm -hmm. um, made from uh, life force or life energy. Um, and um, the, the interesting thing about these chakras that some people um, just dismiss as some um, spiritual nonsense or um, I don't know, stupid idea. The interesting thing about this is that we have uh, as part of our endocrine system and our nervous system, a um, exact, uh, what's the word for this? Um, A counterpart on our physical side. Mm. We have uh, um, in our endocrine system, oh my cat is coming, um, a funny. reflection of the chakra and we have also a plexus, a nerve um, um, area in this area where we have our chakras. Mm -hmm. So um, this shows that the, 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 the um, physical body, the um, 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 gross body uh, needs to come there's Nala my there you go <laughs> uh, needs to correspond through the uh, uh, energy sheet with the outside world and this is also how it communicates with us and if we have blockages here we usually find that the blockage may be in our in an outer shell in an outer uh, body of ours it could be uh, Manumaya Kosha, the um, intellect, not the, the uh, mind body. It could be the intellectual body or even beyond that. And it always goes from the outside through our chakras in here. So for example, if we have a problem with our thyroid, in most cases you find thyroid problems, but well, basically I have found a thyroid problem. It could be even a Hashimoto disease in depressed women. And what does it mean? If you have a depression, that means you're under pressure. You're not free. You're not free to express yourself. Right. You're not free to live your life. Then this chakra will be blocked. And beneath that, on the endocrine uh, level, we have our thyroid. But we also have a very important nervous plexus here because this is where our nervous vagus is meeting. And then separating again. So it's like they're so connected. What, so it's like they are the, all connected. So it's like if you have then, a, 
uh, throat chakra problem, then maybe you'll have also the physical manifestation of that problem or the mental. You said it absolutely right. Right. The problem is because I'm also, if you look at the modern way of uh, looking at or the modern perspective, I love psychosomatic um, approaches towards any di disease. So I believe psyche, some subtle energy, some subtle problem that is not connected to our gross body um, causes our gross body to react. So the Something problem from outside. The outside comes through our chakra, which is blocked, which doesn't work properly into our body and causes a problem here. Now the allopathic doctor goes to your thyroid, gives you some uh, L-tyroxine, L -L -L some, some, um, some thyroid pills. supplements. Yeah, <clears throat> exactly. Thyroid supplements. But he does never look at the psychological or mind or mental or energetic problem that is outside there. So for me, when we look at the chakras, we look at the gates from our subtle body into the cross the material body. And so we you're have saying, to always consider them. So are you saying that also from the, the energy in the, your environment is also affecting your chakras? It's not just your spiritual state. So if you're spiritually Absolutely. not strong enough, then all the environments are going to be affecting you all the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Yes. And uh, we, we presume that uh, Ramana Maharshi was beyond that level. He was beyond, uh, you know, the, to be affected by the world. Um, because I, I believe not his... At will, Mat Matya. Not at, at will. will. Because um, there are many um, stories about him. Um, there's a very famous story that pretty, pretty well depicts that he could also be a very normal human. He was um, responsible for the kitchen. It was his ashram. And he was a person that didn't like to um, throw things away or that uh, waste things. <clears throat> he he uh, grew up and he lived with very scarce resources um, also to feed himself. He depended on many years just on one single woman that actually brought him leaves and stuff to feed himself. And so especially the kitchen was an area as far as I uh, remember um, hearing and reading about it where he uh, was a very human being. And when the cooks wasted anything, for example, they missed did something in their kitchen and they dug it into the ground next day Bhagavan would go there and find it and put his stick on it and then go back to the kitchen take the, the cooks out there showed them what they did and he was scolding them is that the right word he was scolding them punishing scolding them, them. Yeah. yeah yeah so um at will he could be a very uh, strong um personality as well so he sure. was not entirely gone to the other side as if you want to right 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 well um well even even jesus got upset that uh, the money changes were in the temple and he uh, exactly and uh but but that's um i don't know i think there is a place for um uh, for a righteous kind of you know, not an indignation, but a righteousness that's, uh, you know, you did, you're doing something wrong and all that. And, and then people misconstrue it as something else. Um, this is your tea, I guess. <laughs> yes, this is my um, tea. <laughs> um, okay, lastly, I would like to, so what would be your advice in general for people that are struggling with something um, to, to do? Would you advise them on spiritually or would you advise them to, what would you advise in general people to do to to get better health or have more happiness because i believe that is that would be your goal right well your question was what would you advise to people that are struggling yes that is a question i'm i'm not entitled to answer i would if i know what you want to hear or what what you're asking um there's so many different kinds of struggles so the first thing you need to identify what kind of struggle do they have okay let's uh let's say spiritually they um they're living their life they're earning a lot of money but they're empty inside they they don't have... <laughs> oh i can relate to that <laughs> <laughs> i know that's why i asked so uh um... okay so what would i advise to them um the first thing i would from the 
bottom of my heart, I would, anyone out there, not even just those that make a lot of money like I did and that get desperate because they, they don't move on in life or in their spiritual development. The first thing I advise them is to go and find a teacher. Here's the trick. When I say go and find a teacher, I don't mean for them to travel to India or come and knock at my door or something like that. Not at all. It could be a book. Find yourself a teacher. That is my teacher. She <laughs> is lying at my feet and she's just so peaceful and happy. Yes. Look at your cat. Look at your partner in life. Look at your children. Any pet. A colleague in your workplace. Find yourself a teacher. Now, that is the most difficult thing because how do you accept a colleague that gives you shit every day as your teacher? Well, if you really want to know about love, that would be the perfect teacher. And I've had clients that went through that and uh, they, they're very blissful because they realize that if I can love my so-called enemy, I am actually loving. Now, any teacher that you find should show you one thing, and that is the way back into your heart. And this is how we started our conversation, Matthias. Because if you come back here, you don't need anything. You don't need a teacher. So all these teachers, these gurus need to show you all these reflections of yourself in the outside world are meant to show you is what is your current state on your journey towards here? Right. If you have a good and, teacher, that's the only thing that this teacher will show you. How mm -hmm. far are you on that journey towards that? Some people um, t uh, show you what to do and some people show you what not to do. But uh, that's also a way of looking at it. And um, I, I would say uh, to people that if they uh, can get a mentor or something like that, that's... Um, that has their best interest at heart. I think that's uh, that is a very good thing. And if you get a either a Ramana Maharshi books, or other um, there are other books that, um, or some people find religion as well. Twelve step groups. There's a lot of help out there. Um, okay, so um, there's a teacher of whatever kind that is suitable for anyone out there. That's why I'm answering your question by saying find your teacher whatever it is, by looking into the mirror and looking right into your face, that could be your teacher. Yeah, what you said about other people, like looking at other people as a, as a, as a challenge to love, it reminded me of a quote um, by Eric Hoffer that it's easier to love humanity than to love your neighbor because your neighbor is right, he's right there and it's hard to, you know, because he's annoying you in some way, but yeah. The ideal humanity, having the ideal, all that it is um, a lot of people do that. Oh, I love humanity, but then I hate this, or I, ha I hate her, and uh, you know, is a lot of that. Um, may, okay. may I add something very important? I believe very important to that. And you brought his name um, up. What I try to teach people is um, don't love your neighbor, love yourself. That is even harder. Now, the guy that you mentioned by the name of Jesus said exactly the same. Love thy neighbor as you love yourself. Now, the point here is not to love the neighbor. That's not what he is saying. He is saying, love yourself, because unless you do that, you will never be able to love your neighbor. So don't mistake this as a command to love your neighbor. It is about loving yourself. Now, once you do that, you're pure love. Right. So you yeah. love automatically all humanity and your neighbors. Well, because it's the same. Once you love, start loving yourself, then you automatically increase the, or you start even accepting yourself some uh, defects about yourself. Then you increase the capacity yes. to, uh, to, uh, to accept other people. I'm also paraphrasing now, Eric Hoffer, which I love. Anyway, um, so this was an excellent conversation, Rolf Koch. Koch, sorry, Koch. Koch. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so we can expect your book sometime next year is that correct?
correct? <laughs> well, by the end of this year, I hope Janine reminded me today that I yes. was not writing. I was actually doing some research and other stuff. So and, uh, and when you do, uh, I will add the link uh, underneath the, the YouTube video or the uh, and the Spotify um, uh, links and the podcasting links. I mean. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, thank you so much for uh, for being on and uh, and sharing your knowledge of Ayurveda and Ramana Maharshi and diets and sleep and other things. Uh, it was very, <laughs> were very good. And thank you. Um, and um, thank you everybody for listening and watching. And uh, thank you, Rolf Kof, for being on the show. Thank you much. Thank you very much.